I'm going to give you a second chance. I'm going to read it again. And I'm going to ask you to rate your understanding again. The only difference is this time, before I read it, I'm going to tell you the title of the paragraph. Now, the title of the paragraph is Washing Clothes. So doing laundry, right? So here's the paragraph. The procedure is actually quite simple. First, you arrange things into different groups. Of course, one pile may be sufficient depending on how much there is to do. If you have to go somewhere else due to lack of facilities, that is the next step. Otherwise, you are pretty well set. It is important not to overdo things. That is, it is better to do too few things at once than too many. In the short run, this may not seem important, but complications can easily arise. A mistake can be expensive as well. At first, the whole procedure will seem complicated. Soon, however, it will become just another fact of life. It is difficult to foresee any end to the necessity for this task in the immediate future. So rate yourself again, A, B, C, D, or E. Okay, everybody's done that. So I have a question, and I'll only see the responses from the people in the audience. How many people, raise your hand, you can raise your hand if you're watching on the webinar as well, I just won't know it. Um, but raise your hand if your level of understanding went up in the second reading. Okay, so in the, in the audience here, everybody raised their hand. Now you might say, sure, you gave me a second chance. The more times I repeat something, the better I understand it. But I think there's something else going on here, and we could actually demonstrate that if we had a little more time. Um, the thing that, uh, so I'll just say everyone. The thing that is going on is that in that second reading, you had a context, or what a psychologist would say, you had a mental model for what I was talking about. And the way people learn and understand new information is by plugging it into some existing mental model. So whenever you hear something new, you're looking for some place in an existing framework where you can plug that information. And if you have a strong and, and an appropriate existing framework, it's very easy to understand the new information that's coming toward you. If you have no framework or an incorrect framework, it's very, very hard to understand the new information that's coming toward you. So how many people ever have ever th sort of thought that this has impacted your use of a product or a service? So you're trying to use a product, and maybe your reading instructions is telling you to push some buttons or do some things, but you just don't understand the big picture of what's going on. It's a very typical design failure. And I can tell you whether you're a current student or an alum, it's actually also a very typical student failure because a lot of students sometimes, some, some students, I won't say a lot, come to class late, even two or three minutes late. And when a student comes to class late, if they have a good professor, what they've just meant, missed is that first two or three minutes when the instructor is giving the mental model and the context for what's going to happen in the rest of the class. So instructor rocks in and says, Yesterday we were talking about such and such. You read such and such before you came to class today. Today we're going to connect those things together and relate it to something that's happening in the news right now. And then two students walk in the door and sit down and they haven't heard any of that. Or maybe they're in the room but they're just not sort of zoned in yet, right? And they've missed the context. And then what they have is just a string of facts coming at them, sort of like the first time I read the paragraph to you. And they have no context to plug those facts into. So being to class on time uh, is, is really important. If you're an alum, it's too late for you, unfortunately. Uh, but for the students who are in the room, come to class on time. OK, let's move on to some cultural examples. So uh, one, one real simple example has to do with when you're laying out a page, so a physical page in a print publication or a screen, an electronic screen. Understanding something about the culture and the language that of the people who are reading the content has an impact on how you lay out the page. So for example, in English, people are going to scan the page from left to right and top to bottom. But that's not true in all cultures and all languages. So if there's something that you want to draw attention to, the place that you're going to put it on the page is going to vary based on the culture and the language. Another example, uh, so here I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use an example that relates to Japanese culture. Um, so it has to do with the use of special symbols like check marks. So in the United States, 
a check mark is pretty universally understood to mean something good. So if you get a homework, teacher puts a lot of check marks on it, that means good, 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 good. Um, in Japan, a teacher is much more likely to write an O to mean good. A check does not always mean good, and sometimes a check can actually mean not, not so good. So you're much like, more likely to see these O's to indicate good in Japan. And that could influence a designer's choice of an icon. So here's an example from a train station. I cannot read this, but I had uh, somebody help me with it today. See these O's over here? They might look like zeros, but they're O's. These O's are indicating that there are seats available on these trains, lots of seats. So it would be sort of like having a check mark if that column says availability of seats. And I'm not sure what the column says. It would be like having a check mark. A triangle would mean there are some seats available, but not too many. And an X would mean there are no seats available. That's a cultural convention, right? It's going to differ uh, from culture to culture. Here's another. This is from my, my summer vacation. So I, get, I knew I'd have to have a way to show a summer vacation photo. I was in Japan this summer, and I saw a can of Spam for sale in Japan. And I looked at the can of Spam, and I looked at the, uh, the picture on the can, right, this, and I thought, huh, you would never see that in the United States. What is that a picture of? Can you even tell? So I could tell because I was in Japan and I knew what that would be. The bottom layer, the white layer is rice. And then this, this sort of darker thing right here, this band is seaweed. It's a band of seaweed holding the spam and the rice together. And this would not be how you would advertise spam in the United States, right? You wouldn't show spam being served on a bed of rice wrapped in seaweed, but it makes perfect sense to show it this way in Japan. So it's another cultural example of a place where culture impacts design. Let's move a little closer to the areas that I uh, study. I'm going to talk about a, a mathematics example and then a computer science example. There's an area of mathematics called A-B testing. And I don't know how many people are aware of A-B testing, but you're all participants in A-B testing every day, whether you know it or not. So I'm going to let you in on the secret of how this works. Big companies like Amazon.com and Google use something called A-B testing to improve their websites. And here's how it works. So when most people go to, let's, let's take Amazon.com as, as an example. When most people navigate to Amazon.com, what they see is the regular version of Amazon's website. Right, the standard version that essentially everybody sees. But on any given day, there's a small random subset of people selected. And when they go to Amazon.com, they see a test version of the site. And they probably don't even realize it's a test version of the site because test version may mean something as simple as they've moved the, the placement and the size of the Buy Now button a couple of pixels one way or the other way. They've made some very, very small adjustment to the site. Um, not even really noticeable to most people. And then what they do is they watch and they see whether the people who are seeing the test version of the site buy more frequently than the people who are seeing the standard version of the site. And they have enough traffic on Amazon.com that they can actually do this and do a statistical test of significance. If more people who use the test version of the site buy the products, the test version of the site becomes the standard version of the site. They put a new test version of the site out, and they just keep incrementing like this. They just keep evolving the site to improve the design. And here the notion of improving the design is getting more people to do what you want them to do, which is buy. Right? At the PAW, it may be getting people to click on a, on a certain story on the home page or getting people to uh, finish an application that they've started. There are lots of big sites that do this um, in order to improve their sites statistically. And you're all participants, whether you know it or not. So here's my computer science and engineering example. And I have some statistics here. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to find the right page. This, does anyone know what this is? Anyone who's at the PA or at home? Can you see this? This is what you're looking at, not the tie. Don't say it's a red tie. Uh, we're looking at this. This is the first cell phone. 
first mobile phone. This phone, uh, this, was, this picture was in 1984. It was the fall of 1984. I was a senior in college when this picture was taken. The weight of this phone was two pounds. The price was $3,995. The talk time in between charges was 30 minutes. Um, and there were lots of technology improvements between 1984 and now. It's not really that long if you think about it, to think about how much a phone has changed. And the reason that I, that I show this slide is if you think about the iPhone that you have in, in your pocket or the Android phone that you have in your pocket or even the, the relatively dumb phone that you have in your pocket if you don't have a smartphone, the improvements in design from this device to what you're walking around with now that is largely due to engineering and computer science and technology. Improvements tend to come incrementally, and a lot of times people see an initial version of a design, it's not very good. You could imagine looking at that and saying, why would anybody want one of these? Who would want to carry this around, right? And so it's easy to dismiss these new things that, would come, that come out, but you've got to remember that designs are going to improve over time incrementally, and the first thing you see is not necessarily equivalent to the way the design is going to end up. Okay, our last little segment about design before we open this up for, for questions is an area of design that I'm really interested in. It has to do with designing intentionally to change somebody's attitudes or behaviors. And it's a kind of design called persuasive design. So instead of designing what the person wants, instead of me building what I think my end user wants, I'm going to build something to try to change the way my end user thinks or behaves in some way. It could be an environmental domain. I want to change some environmental behavior they have. It could be health related. It could be related to purchasing. Can anyone in the DePaul audience think of a, an example before I give some examples? One should feel very familiar. Speed bumps, Speed bumps are a great example, right? They try to persuade you to slow down. They don't force you to slow. It's not like they're putting nails in the tire and forcing you to slow in the, in the street, but they persuade you to slow down, speed bumps. The Amazon.com example is persuasive, too. Like how many people log into Amazon.com, maybe you'd like to read this book and this book and this book based on what you've liked before, right? That's a persuasive technology. Facebook has all kinds of persuasive technologies to encourage you to engage, to post, to interact with people. So there are, there are persuasive technologies all around you. Um, here are a couple of examples. This one, does anyone recognize what this is? We're looking at this part of the, the image over here. I kind, of, I kind of blanked out on the left, the description, because I want to talk this through. This is a, luckily we see fewer and fewer of these around. It's a, it's a cigarette disposal bin. So it's a, it's a metal bin. So, so some of the students may never have seen these. I don't know. It's a metal bin. There's usually some sand in the bottom. And the idea was you could lift the lid and throw a cigarette butt in it, and it wouldn't you know, catch on fire with the trash. But the p part I want you really to notice is the top of the bin, which I don't know how well you can see this, but it's slanted downward. In fact, this kind of design is sometimes called slanty design because of this example. Does anyone know why they would slant the bin downward? What are they, what are they trying to get someone to do or not do? It might be discouraging you from sitting on. It's probably too light uh, to support most people and probably too high, but you're warm. Not setting the cigarette on it, or what else might people have that they might just trash? So, they, so people would set soda cans on it. They would set uh, Coke cans. They would set cups. They would set basically rubbish, trash on it. Um, there are all kinds of examples where ledges and sills, like window sills, are slanted just slightly to either discourage sitting or to discourage people from leaving trash there. Just a slight slant can really impact behavior. Here's, a, whoops, here's another example. Uh, so look at these seats. And, and what I can tell you about this example, this used to be a bench. And they took the bench out and replaced the bench with discrete seats. 
and they had a per, per, particular reason for doing this. This isn't a public transportation station. What behavior might they have been trying to encourage or discourage by changing the benches to individual seats? Say it again. Maybe. Uh, by keeping the people apart? Maybe. Sleeping is the, is the classic one, right? So if you have problems, this may or may not be a good solution, but this is the solution this group chose. If you have problems with people sleeping on the benches, one way to get around those problems is to change the benches into seats. That's an example of a slanty design. Okay, so we'll connect this a little bit uh, back to the first year seminar course that I teach. I, st I told you that's where uh, I, st I, I was going to give you a sense of what that course was like. So during this course, students uh, read, they write, and they discuss these general design principles. And they also read and write about and discuss design failures. So they read a lot of stories about places where design went wrong. Often people end up dead in these stories. Some of them are sort of depressing. And then the students try to do an analysis of what the design failure was and make a recommendation for uh, mediating the failure in the future. And there are a lot of ethical issues related to these things as well. So even the, even the uh, example I just gave, right, with the seats and the benches, you know, is it good to remove a place for people to sleep in a train station or is that a bad thing to do? I mean, it's, it's not so clear. Depends on your viewpoint and, and certainly who you are, right? Um, and then near the end of the course, students do a multi-stage research paper. Uh, so they really think about writing as a, as a design problem as well. You have an audience that you're writing for. You've got to think about designing what it is you want to say in the paper, how you're going to organize the paper, how you're going to visually present the paper as well. So for people who are watching online, all first-year students at DePauw take a first-year seminar course in their first semester. These are typically interdisciplinary courses. They're usually around 14 students. The faculty member in these courses is the student's academic advisor. There's an upper-class mentor who helps with the student's acclimation to DePauw. The courses are very writing-focused and speaking-focused. And this first year seminar and mentor program has really become a, a hallmark of uh, the first year experience at DePauw in the last uh, decade or so. Okay, so our goals for today were to convince you that design is ubiquitous, so it's all around us, to convince you that poor design is very common, to give you a little sense of the kinds of issues that students study in the first year seminar course uh, that I teach, and then to demonstrate, I think most importantly, that the liberal arts really is very relevant to design because design is something that can be approached from multiple vantage points. And this comes back to my argument that liberal arts students really do specialize. They specialize in um, an excellent approach to solving problems that need the, uh, the, the lens of multiple disciplines in order to understand. That's really what our students are specialized in. So here's a book if anybody's interested in additional reading. This is one of the books I use in this seminar. It's called The Design of Everyday Things by Don Norman. Don Norman is both a psychologist and a computer scientist. Um, you can see this interestingly designed uh, tea kettle uh, on the front, which doesn't make a lot of sense because the handle and the spout are on the same side. The first time I taught this course in a first year seminar, uh, at the end of the semester, the students got me a gift. I had no idea what it was. They came with this big rack, wrapped box and uh, I opened it up and it was sort of like opening a gift from one of your children and finding out it was a homemade gift and that made it even more special. But they actually made, I, I'm showing this because I think some of the students from this class, I believe it was in fall of 99 or watching online. And so they actually made, they found one of these mugs and they, they cut off the handle from this side and sort of welded it or melted it back onto the other side and gave me one of these. And uh, I can tell them that I drink from it not, not so often. Um, but I enjoy keeping it on my shelf. Um, so I think with that, I'm going to open things up for questions. I think there's a way for people who are online to type questions in, and somebody here will read them out to me. And uh, I welcome questions from folks who are in the audience as well. Definitely appreciate everybody's participation today. and. Uh, interested to hear what questions or reactions uh, people have. So we're... 
Yeah, so um, there's a whole philosophy uh, school of design that focuses on intentionally trying to design things to be hard to use. So just to be clear, I'm not talking about things that are hard to use. I'm talking about things which were intentionally designed to be hard to use. And usually when I say that, people, I, I sort of see looks in the audience, like why would anybody design anything to be hard to use? But then usually once I get one example on the table, it becomes clear that there are actually hundreds and hundreds of these things. So does anyone have one example? Yeah. Yeah, so the classic, the classic example of this is the childproof cap on a medicine bottle, which is intentionally designed to be hard to open because you don't want children to accidentally open it, right? So there's a good reason to make it hard. These pill bottles can have an unintended consequence. Uh, there's actually some correlation between age. We talked about thinking about age before when you design and the likelihood you are to take pills or lots of pills. So older people need to take a lot of pills Sometimes older people have arthritis or other problems that make it hard for them to open these bottles. And they're also less likely in general to have young children in their home. So you can buy bottles that are non-childproof as well, right? But that's an example. There's, there's actually tons and tons of these things. I can toss them out. But does anyone who's in the room have any others that come to mind? Do we have any athletes here? Or people who work out? I know we do. Golf, right? So, you know, how could you imagine designing a game any harder than golf, right? Like, why does the cup have to be so small? Why does the ball have to be so small? Why does the distance between the tee and the green have to be so long? Basketball, I know we have a basketball player here, right? Why does the hoop have to be 10 feet in the air? And why can't the rim be bigger? It's intentionally designed to be hard. Um, there's actually a theory... Has anyone used a Rubik's Cube? Right? Hard. Hard to use. Right? Hard to use. So there's a whole theory to game design called the on-ramp experience, where you want to get that on-ramp, the initial experience, to be just hard enough to be challenging and to kind of lure somebody in, but not so hard that it's completely frustrating and they walk away in disgust without ever really trying. Different sports are well known to have different on-ramps. So there are some sports that you can sort of, you know, kickball, right? You can, you can, it may be hard to become excellent, but you can kind of start out and do something pretty easily. Whereas uh, golf, uh, you, you really can't do much without a fair amount of practice. So that's another example. Anyone think of other examples? Money? So tell me, you're, you're right, can you tell me why? So people don't counterfeit it, right? So it's kind of hard. Uh, it's intentionally hard to, for example, use put money into. Why? Why do those machines, those vending machines, always reject your money, right? Why don't they just accept it more easily? Well, the problem is if they accepted it more easily, they might accept counterfeit money as well, right? So money is another example of that. Things that are dangerous are one more category. So if you've got a power tool, so some lawnmowers, for example, you've got to have both hands on the handle and be squeezing in a certain way. Uh, nuclear missiles, pretty hard to launch a nuclear missile. You can't just accidentally rub up against the button and, and launch it. Hard, right? Two people and keys and combinations and stuff. It's intentionally hard, right? So there tends to be things are hard often involving safety, involving sports. Are there students in the room and teachers? There are. Can you think of anything academic that's intentionally designed to be hard? Exams, right? <laughs> Exams and courses are designed to be, like, it's not like, let's see how we can make this as easy as possible. Uh, it's designed to be hard, designed to be just hard enough, hopefully, to stretch person, to stretch the students just beyond where they are. So the whole DePauw experience is designed to challenge people. Right, hopefully in a good way, but that's intentional. It's supposed to be challenging. Do we have any anyone online yet or not? We do. Uh, here's a question from one of our webinar viewers. What are your thoughts on how much data information should be displayed to a user on a product? Um, so I think my answer, so the question is how much data should be displayed to a user on a product? And there are really lots of ways to answer that. So one way is to think about 
your own data, so a, a product displaying information about your own usage. So for example, a Fitbit um, displays lots of information about your own usage in order to motivate you. And that's probably a good thing. I think the, the times that we get into trouble are when products display information about other users and the other users don't necessarily realize that the information is being displayed. So there's a big debate about opt-in versus opt-out on Facebook, for example. So do we display my activity on Facebook to other people only if I intentionally allow it or as long as I don't intentionally disallow it? Uh, and I, I, I tend to be in favor of opt-outs. Um, or sorry, of opt-ins, of, of letting the user explicitly opt-in to sharing data. Any, any questions from anyone here? Another or, question online. What's your favorite product design? Wow. Um, well, I have to, I have to t admit that I'm a, I'm a Windows user uh, for everything. Except, and I'm looking at somebody in the audience as I say this, I really love my iPhone. And I tried for various reasons, I won't get into looking at another person in the audience, to switch from an, uh, an iPhone to an Android phone. Uh, and that lasted about a year. And I just wasn't able to do it. I, I really find the, what's called the user experience on the iPhone to be more satisfying. So, there are two ways typically of evaluating products. There's something called the usability. Does it let you do what you need to do? Can you make the phone call, yes or no? And then the user experience is more, how does the product make you feel when you're using it? Do you feel good? Um, and I just, I feel good when I'm using my <laughs> iPhone. Uh, so good that sometimes I'm using my iPhone while I'm walking down the street and almost gonna get run over by a car or something like that. But my iPhone is high up on my list. Yes. So I actually planned on asking this uh, before that question, but it's a good follow-up. Is there something in the real world or the internet that you would love to change the design of? So is there something in the real world um, or the internet that I would like to change the design of? Vince is smiling smugly as I, as I pondered this. So I could think of uh, a number of things that I would like to change, and I'm going to go with the PAW example, and I'll give you the example, but I'm also going to give caveats. Um, it's really interesting to me that when students think about course selection at DePauw, they don't have, and this isn't just a DePauw thing. I, so I see students nodding. There are some DePauw specific things I could talk about here. This is course selection in general, or just education in general. There isn't nearly as much information to help people find things they might want to learn about, as there is, for example, to help people find products they might want to buy on Amazon or movies they might want to watch on Netflix or recipes they might like or music they might listen to. There are a lot of what are called recommender systems that sort of say, well, if you like this song and this song and this song, you might also like this one that you've never heard of and you might try it. We don't really have sophisticated recommender systems to help students. And by students, I don't just mean I'm a student, right? People who want to learn things, whether you're a, a college student or just a student of life, to help people learn what they might want to learn about and to have recommendations made to them. So I'd like to see a system like that. The caveat is you'd want to make sure that the system didn't um, sort of focus you in and sort of say, well, you, since you liked A, B, and C, you'll probably like D too because D is very similar to A, B, and C. We want people obviously to explore broadly. And so the idea would be some sort of a recommender system that gave you things you might want to learn about based on your interests, but didn't sort of narrow your choices too much. Yes. Okay, so repeat yeah, I'll repeat the question. Thoughts are, what, what are my thoughts on how ethics interfaces with design? It, every single design decision, almost every single design decision is an ethical decision. Um, there are uh, so many examples of this from campus. Uh, I'll, I'll give you a simple one. Um, whether to set the default printers to be 
uh, one-sided or two-sided. So whether we're going to have paper, when, when students and faculty print things to our public printers, whether we're going to use one side of the sheet or two sides of the sheet. That could be seen as simply a financial decision, but that really can be seen as an ethical decision as well. And it becomes even more complicated than you would imagine. So it's not just the environmental issue, but there's an issue that all students get a certain number of pages that they can print for free. Um, some students can afford more easily than other students to add pages if they run out. So there are sort of socioeconomic aspects of that issue as well. Um, again, I'd, I'd be hard pressed to come up with an example of a design question that isn't ethical. It's another reason why it's great to study design in an environment like a liberal arts college, especially one with an ethics institute. So. Okay, I think we may be. One more question One more just question. came in from our online viewers. Uh, do you think the pros, cons of being first to market outweigh getting the design more refined? So this is a really this, timely yeah. question. It's do you think the pros of being first to market outweigh um, getting the design right? And there's, there's been a lot of uh, momentum in the design world lately, especially for online designs for something called minimum viable product. And the idea is you get an initial design out very, very quickly, and then you get a lot of feedback from users, and you let that feedback drive where you're going to go. Um, the danger to that is exactly what the person asking the question is, is, is sort of getting at, is if you put your initial idea out too early before it's fully baked, you open yourself up to somebody else copying your idea and maybe getting it better, especially if they have more resources. So unfortunately, I don't think there's an easy answer to this. The general rule of thumb is you want to get your design out early if you have something called a differentiator, something that you can really use to uh, protect some kind of an advantage that you have that you can use to protect other people from copying you. But if you don't have that, you want to do a little bit more homework before you get your idea out. With that, we'll thank you, Dr. Burke, for another enlightening talk tonight. I've actually heard this talk a few times, and uh, it's always entertaining and thought-provoking. So thank you so much, Dr. Burke. Thank you, everybody, for participating.